When a dreadnought is no longer enough, that is when you build a super dreadnought. When dreadnoughts started to outclass themselves, as much as the first of the type had already outclassed every battleship built before them. What makes a dreadnought super, though? There is one classical answer, just as there always is. Just as there was one general answer for semi-dreadnoughts before them, or even for dreadnoughts themselves. Differently from either of the previous categories, though, Super Dreadnoughts seem to follow that general answer pretty much universally. As for what that general answer is, well, we'll get into that, as well as how a Super Dreadnought quite often comes down to just one part of that answer. As for the name, well, Super Dreadnought is at least a simple way to describe a ship more powerful than an older Dreadnought. It would have gone rather silly, though, if people had continued the trend with Mega or Ultra Dreadnoughts. Right. To understand this, one first needs to understand Dreadnoughts themselves. Though I will not go too terribly long on that topic, as it will get a video on its own, as will pre-Dreadnoughts, in this little series I started with semi-Dreadnoughts. A Dreadnought is, fundamentally, simply a battleship that has an all-big gun armament. Where a pre-Dreadnought would have a lot of secondary guns of different calibers, and only two turrets, though some exceptions apply, form the main battery, a Dreadnought would have anywhere from 8 to 14 main battery guns, though the latter number is admittedly on the extreme end of things. The important thing is that, no matter how many big guns the ship in question has, those are the primary weaponry. Secondary guns are limited to anti-destroyer work, and cut down drastically in importance. Semi-Dreadnoughts, for their part, straddle this line in that they generally carry the same main battery as a pre-Dreadnought, but have their secondary guns consist of large caliber weapons and turrets, just not the same size guns as their main battery. There are other defining characteristics of a Dreadnought than just the guns, mind you. Another defining trait is an increase in the size of the ship. A Dreadnought is generally quite a bit larger than a pre-Dreadnought. Furthermore, these ships are often, though not universally, faster than pre-dreadnoughts. Maintaining that speed does depend on the navy, as some held to the old triple expansion engines longer than others. However, with exceptions like the South Carolina class existing, you'll generally see a ship classified as a dreadnought based entirely on the main battery. South Carolina is very much a dreadnought, yet she was held to the same displacement as pre-dreadnoughts of the USN. So she barely increased in size and didn't really gain any speed at all. Yet because of having an all-big gun layout, she's a Dreadnought. Keep that in mind as we get into Super Dreadnoughts here. We can start by saying the origin of the concept is tied to the Royal Navy in a way that Dreadnought herself really isn't. Other navies were working on Dreadnought-style ships at the same time as Dreadnought herself, a combination of Fisher pushing very hard to get her in the water, and other navies being slow on the draw is what saw Dreadnought come out first. The Super Dreadnought, however, differs here. While the USN was certainly looking at 14-inch guns as early as Florida, they wouldn't put them on a ship until the New York class. And this is important because the arguably biggest factor in considering a ship a Super Dreadnought is a sudden jump in main gun caliber and everything related to that. And the Royal Navy got to be very much the trendsetter here, beating all other navies to the punch, in some cases by quite a large margin. Other navies would, in turn, start looking at larger caliber guns more seriously as a direct counter to the Royal Navy doing it. The first of the Super Dreadnoughts, HMS Orion, is built entirely around that increase in main battery size. A drastic step up from preceding Royal Navy battleships, Orion came about as a very nearly clean slate design. The previous Dreadnoughts had all been incremental improvements on each other from Dreadnought onwards. Orion was a break from this trend, being an entirely new design in all the ways that matter anyway, brought about by the Royal Navy never being entirely satisfied with their quote-unquote improved 12-inch guns. With an increase in battle range and other navies catching up to the Royal Navy in firepower, getting a more powerful gun became imperative to keep the Royal Navy ahead. Thus, you see the caliber of 13.5 inches make a return. What's important to keep in mind here is that an increase in gun caliber also equates to an increase in the size of the ship, at least if you actually want to improve on broadside fire weight. This is notable in Orion in that she gains somewhere in the range of 2,000 tons on previous ships. I've seen this described as an unprecedented jump in displacement. 
as we'll get into, that's not entirely accurate. But I digress. Orion, in addition to gaining in her gun caliber and overall displacement, featured a marginally heavier armor layout and a jump to an all centerline turret layout. That latter one is also generally seen as a feature of Super Dreadnoughts, moving from the various wing turret designs to mounting all the guns on the centerline, super firing. As a cursory glance at other navies will tell you, having guns mounted in that style does not a Super Dreadnought make. What is important is the distinction of moving away from wing turrets. So just because you start with all your guns mounted on the center does not mean it's a Super Dreadnought. Comparing Orion and Dreadnought in particular, you see about a 25% increase in displacement and a doubling, more or less, of broadside weight. So with that done and Orion herself out of the way, we have our main factors on what makes a Super Dreadnought. 1. A sudden increase in gun caliber. In the Royal Navy, this was a jump from 12 inches to 13.5 inches. In the USN in Japan, it was to 14 inches. And in France, it was to 13.4 inches. 2. An accompanying increase in displacement, generally seen as several thousand tons, ranging from the 2,000 or so of Orion to a much larger jump like something like Fuso, which was more like 8,000 tons. 3. Swapping from wing turrets to some flavor of an all centerline turret layout. And 4. An increase in armor protection, though this one is admittedly more of a side benefit than a proper factor. Those are the main factors on what makes a Super Dreadnought. Speed could also be considered when it comes to later Super Dreadnoughts, though it's not as big of a factor as the other ones. Regardless, these factors make for a fairly firm dividing line between the early Dreadnoughts and Super Dreadnoughts. Or do they? You see, I've alluded to it, but other than the increase in gun caliber, these factors aren't as clear-cut as it may at first appear. Let's take out the main gun caliber argument for now, and look at the other factors first. We can begin on that one with the USN. I'm not going to count the jump from South Carolina, restricted as she was, to Delaware here. That was entirely because of the change from limited to the same size as pre-dreadnoughts to that restriction is gone. If you want to count it, though, you can see a jump of three to 5,000 tons between South Carolina and Delaware, as well as an increase in firepower of eight 12-inch guns to 10 of the same kind. Ignoring that for the moment, we can instead look at other USN ships. Delaware and Florida are pretty much identical to each other, with only about 1,000 tons of difference. This came down to changes in the engine room, the beam of the ships, and their increased secondary battery. None of these changes matter much here. Wyoming, however, was a sudden and very sharp jump from Florida's 23,000 tons of displacement right up to 27,000 tons. That's an even larger jump than Orion managed at about 4,000 tons between the ships. So in Wyoming, we have the classical large increase in displacement argument. Does that make Wyoming a super dreadnought? Well, pretty much no one would say that. She gained a longer 12-inch gun and an extra pair of turrets on Florida, but it's still 12-inch guns. What about other navies? Italy would see a similar jump in weight between Dante and Cavour. However, this came about mostly due to an increase in armor and an additional turret being fitted. Brazil would have seen a truly massive jump between their first dreadnoughts and what would become HMS Agincourt. Something like 10,000 tons of difference, in fact, at respective full loads. Agincourt is actually a fun one here in that not only does she have a massive increase in tonnage, but she also moved from wing turrets to centerline turrets for her seven mounts. Not much of a change in armor or speed, though, and her main battery retained 12-inch guns for all that she had 14 of the things. Still, Agincourt would have two of the features of a Super Dreadnought here, a large increase in displacement and a swap from wing turrets to centerline ones. And still, I have yet to see anyone call her a Super Dreadnought. So where does that leave us? Russia only built two classes of battleships, and the differences between them are very minor. Other navies jumped right to super dreadnoughts, if they ever built more than one class of dreadnought battleship at all. The exception to the rule is, well, Germany. Imperial Germany would be a weird one here. They held to some form of wing turret all the way through to the Kaiser class. And with each of their classes of dreadnought, you see roughly an Orion level change in tonnage. You are probably beginning to see why I look at Orion's 2,000 ton increase 
with a bit of a side eye when people call it unprecedented. Perhaps for when she was designed, though even then other navies were making larger jumps at about the same time. In any event, these increases in tonnage are caused by multiple factors. Increased range on the ships, more powerful propulsion, increases in armor, all of those sorts of things. Increase in speed was also a running theme, though the ships were generally designed for about the same speed after they moved on from the initial Nassau class. In the Koenig, you would also see the final ditching of wing turrets in favor of a centerline layout for the main battery. Yet, for all of those ships had multiple features on my list of Super Dreadnought features, they are considered to be such. They increased in displacement by just shy of 2,000 tons. They swapped to a centerline turret layout. Their armor wasn't really improved, though it didn't get worse either. But because the ships didn't increase their firepower, they aren't considered Super Dreadnoughts. This is where we come to the point that needs to be made, and the main point of this video, perhaps. People make much of Orion being a culmination of features. It's not just her guns that makes her a Super Dreadnought. The larger size, the improved armor, and the centerline turrets are all important. But all three of those factors are present in other Dreadnoughts and other navies. Had Orion not moved to 13.5 inch guns, she would be more or less in line with USN battleships or the aforementioned German ones. Increase in displacement and overall size can and would be far more drastic than Orion and other navies. Wyoming was quite a bit larger than Florida. Agincourt, again, was massively larger than the other Brazilian dreadnoughts. The Germans basically always went up at least 2,000 tons and quite often more. Armor protection improved in other navies at least to some extent. But not a single one of them are considered super dreadnoughts. The USN didn't get one until New York. France would jump right from Corbeil to Britannia, considered a super dreadnought with her 13.4 inch guns and centerline turrets. Japan would go from Kawachi to Fuso, moving from a ship that some people don't consider a dreadnought, due to having two different kinds of 12 inch guns, to a super dreadnought with 14 inch guns. Italy and Austria Hungary would both have gained super dreadnoughts had they managed to build them, armed with 15 inch and 14 inch guns, respectively. And of course, Germany would finally get a commonly accepted Super Dreadnought in the Bayern class when they made the leap from 12 inch guns to 15 inch guns. What should be apparent here is that no matter what other features one wants to use, it always comes down to one thing Does the ship have guns bigger than 12 inches? It doesn't matter if you add multiple extra turrets like Agincourt or Wyoming. It doesn't matter if there's a large increase in displacement and a switch to centerline turrets like the Germans. A ship will only be considered a super dreadnought in common literature if she jumps up the size of her guns in addition to the other factors. Orion gets to be the first super dreadnought, not because of everything else about her, but because she went to 13.5 inch guns, and all the other improvements are directly related to that. This does rather make it an easy dividing line if you look at it in those terms. You don't have the weirdness of semi dreadnoughts having different kinds of secondary batteries to dig through. You don't have the issue of Kawachi having two different kinds of 12-inch guns. That makes people not consider them dreadnoughts. If someone asked if a ship is a super dreadnought or not, it will almost always come down to, did the ship make a large jump in caliber, and is that caliber bigger than 12 inches? Nice and simple. I'm sure the point could be argued if someone were so inclined, though. That's how history goes, especially when it comes to classifying ships. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next one.